Thank you. Lord Jesus, I do thank you and praise your holy name, Master, for who you are, Lord. I thank you for your word that encourages us and strengthens us each and every day, Lord. I pray for the desire of all of us, Lord, to continue to read and study your word, Master. And as we are taught this night, O oh God, let that word enter into our hearts, O oh God, that we might not only hear it tonight, but we will walk with your word throughout our lives, Lord. I just thank you for everything that you've done for us, doing and going to do. I just praise your holy name, Master, and I just love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is truly good, and I thank God that you are all here with me this evening. It's exciting to be with you guys, and I can't tell you enough um, how wonderful it is. And so we're going to jump into this evening, and I want you to stay with me. Uh, for those of you who are online, you're already seeing the, the title screen. But for those of you who are just on the phone only, I want you to write down Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. And also, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And uh, if Penny, if you can mute yourself, that would be fantastic. I don't know how to. Okay, we'll do it. Can for you? you? Yep, we'll do it for you. All right, we got you. Okay, love it. Love it when a plan comes together. Quote from the A team for those of you who remember the TV sitcom. It's a wonderful thing. All right, let's go. So, as we look at this again, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, and then also 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. Okay? Everyone had those two scriptures written down? We'll get to them, I promise. But before we do, I want to make sure we go to uh, this particular gentleman that you are seeing on your screen. Um, and many years ago, Dr. Tony Campalo, Campalo, Dr. Tony Campalo, uh, was teaching a class at a university. And uh, he was at the University of Pennsylvania when he turned an ordinary lecture into an unforgettable lesson. He asked a student sitting on the front row, young man, he said, how long have you lived? And the unsuspecting student answered by his age. And uh, with that, um, the doctor said, the professor said, no, 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 said Tony. That's how long your heart has been pumping blood. That's not how long you lived. That's when Tony Campalo told the class a story. <clears throat> he told him a story about one of the most memorable moments of his life. It was in 1944, his fourth grade class took a trip and uh, to the top of the Empire State Building, uh, the tallest building in the world at that time. And when nine-year-old Tony got off the elevator and stepped out onto the observation deck overlooking New York City, time stood still for him, okay? And with that being said, if I live a million years, said Tony Capallo. That moment will still be part of my consciousness because I was fully alive when I lived it, okay? Tony turned back to the same student and said, now let me ask you the question again. How long have you lived? When you say it that way, the student said, maybe an hour, maybe a minute, maybe two minutes. Very interesting. As I share with you that story and these two questions that we have there. And those two questions are, how old are you? And then the second question is, how long have you lived? See, it's easy calculating age. 
much more difficult quantifying life. Why? Because time is measured in minutes, but life is measured in moments. What do you think I mean by that? Time is measured in minutes, but life is measured in moments. What do you think I mean? Any thoughts out there? I have one. Go ahead. Uh, um, I don't know if this is too deep or not, but when somebody tells me that time is measured in minutes, I think of the design of time that God created to give us something to measure where he's taking us. And the moments are what we remember. Okay. I like where you're going. I like that. I like that. Erica puts in absolutely moments. Okay. Um, I see something else online. When you are truly present and living in purpose or feeling like purpose. Okay. I like it. Anyone else? Online, I see also <laughs> my crazy self thinks that time we have, uh, but moments is what we capture. Ooh, very nice. Along the same lines. Very good, very good. Anyone else? I like that. Okay, so <clears throat> what are those, and if you're, if you're taking notes, and I hope, I hope that you are, what are those empire state building moments for you? What are those empire state building moments for you? When was the last time time stood still? And if you turn those moments into minutes, how long have you lived? Okay, how long have you lived? See, we're in a series uh, over the past number of weeks, win the day. We've talked about five habits. We talked about flip the script, kiss the wave, eat the frog, fly the kite. And last week we talked about cut the rope and it's time to wind the clock. And that's what habit number six is. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to meet me with, uh, meet me at Ephesians chapter five, verse 16. Ephesians chapter five, verse 16. Who has that for me? Ephesians chapter five, verse 16. I, I have it. Go right ahead, Sister Ruth. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. That's right. Redeeming the times for the days are evil. King James Version. Uh, the uh, New Living Translation says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Before we can talk about minutes and moments, there are three thoughts. The goal of this, this evening, or maybe even next week, is at a right relationship with time. Lots of people live in the wrong time zone, stuck in the past, um, stuck in the past tense of guilt, paralyzed by the future, um, future tense of fear, right, of what's coming. Either way, they're half present, half the time, which means they're half alive. My goal is to close the gap between those questions, how old are you and how long have you lived? I wanna help you uh, to make the most of the minutes and moments, but time management is not just practical, it's theological. So three thoughts before we wind the clock and let's go into them. The first one I wanna to talk to you about if you're taking notes, time is a human construct, all right? Sister Erica was just talking about this uh, in the Facebook chat, right? Talk, we talked about time versus eternity. Time is a human construct. 
with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. I want someone to find for me 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Who has that for me? Second Peter chapter three, verse eight. This is the New okay. Testament. All right, go ahead. Thank you. But you must not forget, dear friends, the day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. Ooh. So with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. That makes no sense in the four dimensions of space-time. If you don't know what that is, I'm going to tell you to Google it on your phone. We don't have time for that right now. Four dimensions of space-time. <clears throat> Here's a newsflash. God does not exist within the space-time dimensions, all right? He created, so there is no past, present, and future for him. For those of you who were uh, there a couple of Sundays, three Sundays ago, you remember me talking about this. All right, so for him, there's no past, present, and future. The challenge we face is that the four dimensions is all we've ever known. In the beginning, we were created in the image of God. We had been creating God in our image ever since. I'm going to say that again. In the beginning, God created, okay? But ever since then, we've been creating God in our image. What does that mean? So we try to timestamp God, right? And we can't, we can't timestamp God. We can't put him in a frame. We can't say... I met the Lord, you know, when you became a Christian. God will say, no, just like Jeremiah, I knew you. I was in relationship with you before you were in your mother's womb. Matter of fact, I know whether I, I'm already with you in the future. I'm already with you on whether you are in... Um, whether you die or whether the trump sounds and you're caught up to meet me in the air, I'm with you now, then, in the future, as well as being with you now in the present, just like I was with you in the past. All right, I'm not gonna go into that. You wanna look at that, go to the YouTube page. Three Sundays ago, it'll make more sense. So we can't timestamp God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the Ancient of Days. In the words of the, the theologian Paul uh, Tillich, God is the eternal now. So when you're looking at yourself today, God is saying, no, 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 no. I've, or I'm looking at you as I see you in your end. So you are already what I've called you to be, whether you see it or not. Time will get you there. Time will get you through your process to be who I called you to be in your own mind. But I already see you, know you as you, as I created and designed you to be, which would be your future. Everyone with me, please say yes or no. Yeah. Arnold, slow down, Pastor. You're crazy. Take your pill. What? How, <laughs> you guys are good with me? Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah. All right. So with that understanding, all of that to say this, creation was God's way of starting the clock. It was, way, it was a way for scientists to have understanding. Okay. And so as we look at this, we have been on the clock since God said, let there be light. That said, the day is coming when we will cross the, the space-time continuum and enter into a dimension the Bible calls heaven. 
we think of heaven as a future destination. And it is. But heaven is in invading the earth. Time, right here, right now. And we're going to talk about it. So the second thing, we've got to live forward. We live forward, but God is working backwards. You and I, we're living forward. We're planning for the future. We're going towards the future. We're talking about tomorrow. We're talking about three months from now. We're talking about what does five years look from now. But God is working backwards. Okay? God is working backwards. It's almost like a movie. Most movies are designed with the end in the beginning. They talk about the end of the movie and they work their way backwards on how they're going to get there. Okay? Same thing for God. He's working backwards. Okay? Because he already knows the end now. He already knew the end before you were birthed. And I see uh, Erica online. Uh, one of her friends is a Scientologist, and that's good, all right? Believes in the Big Bang Theory, all right? So the Big Bang Theory just simply means is that uh, once there was a one solid and, you know, in the galaxies, and ex the explosion happened, and it created the different planets, created the Earth in its perfect axis, in its perfect spin, in its perfect distance, from the sun, how is that even possible, right? And yeah, you're 100% right where there is Scientologists out there, but to be that perfect, to be that precise, where if we were Mars or if we were uh, Mercury, that we would be dead, we would not exist, right? Those kinds of things where it's, it's, it's just, we came from you know the amoeba, right, from out of the water, or we came from apes. If that was the case, why are we still not, why are humans still not transitioning from apes today? It's those kinds of things. But we got to think about, we live forward, we live for the future, right? This is why we have insurance, life insurance. This is why we do medical insurance, car insurance. It's not because something is happening now, it's because, you know, we want to make sure that we're protected for the future. And so we live forward, but God is working backward. Okay, I want us to go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are God's workmanship. Who has that for me? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Anyone have that? Okay, I'm back. All right, back. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained, that we should walk in them. Ooh, okay. I like that. Do I have Sister Stacy out there? Sister Stacy, can you read the New Living Translation for me, if you have it? Sure. Wow, it's Ephesians 2.10, correct? Yes. Uh, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good things that he planned for us long ago. Wait, what? We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works prepared for us in advance. Okay, I know I'm taking you guys to a different place. Welcome to Bible 201, okay? I will be your professor for the evening. And he prepared works for us in advance, as it says, long ago. 
I'm telling you that your script of your life is already written. It's already written. If you can imagine you picking up a book and God is the author of that book. And in that book, there's your name. There's your character on page 127. If you turn with me to the page 127, it's actually chapter five in the world book. Your name is there and your life has already been placed there. And I'm telling you, this tells me that he had planned for you and works for you in advance. We, for we are God's masterpiece. Masterpiece, wait a second. When I think of a masterpiece, I think of a painting that's already drawn. How about you? Yeah. We're God's masterpiece. We're already drawn the details, everything. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Okay, so that means when we accepted Jesus Christ in our mind as his personal savior, as our personal savior, right? He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. I'm here to tell you that God had a plan for you. I'm here to tell you that there was a plan from the beginning. I go back to Jeremiah. I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. I had a plan. There is a plan. And that is something that you have to be able to trust in God, knowing that he will get you there. I know that's hard to believe because we can only deal with our present circumstance and our past experiences. And you might be saying to yourself, pastor, everything about my past experiences and my now tells me that I won't make it to what I heard or I think God has promised for me or what I see in the Bible. So with that being said, do you trust your experiences more than you trust God? The one who created you the one who designed you, the one who has the plan for you, the one who knows your story. You don't know the full script, but God already has the script. He already has the book. He's already written your story. And he puts us on this path to guide us, right? And so this is where our holy confidence comes from. God is setting you up. God wants, God wants you to get where God wants you to go to more than you want to get where God wants you to go. I'll say that again. God is setting you up. God wants you to get where God wants you to go to more than you want to get where God wants you to go. And he's really good at getting you there. He is ordering your footsteps. He is working all things together for your good. Certainly, it doesn't mean all things are good. We live in a fallen world. We live in an evil world. As the Bible says that times will get worse. Bad things happen to good people because of this thing called free will, choices, right? I can talk to you and uh, Deaconess Crawford can talk to you and we can tell you all the things that we can see about forensic files, right? And all the stories that can happen through forensic files. We know that evil things happen because there is free will. There's free choice. There are no robots. God did not design us to be robots. He gave us choice in our mind. That said, God can redeem and recycle the pain and suffering that we've gone through in our lives. And the same God who began a good work will carry it out to completion, the Bible says. There's a fancy word in philosophy called teleology, T-E-L-E-O-L-G-Y, teleology. It's beginning with the end in mind. 
And that's what God is. That's what God does. For us, the arrow of time moves in one direction, past, present, future, okay? Then Jesus shows up and says, before Abraham was, I am. Wait, what does that even mean? Joshua chapter 6, verse 2 gives us a great example. I want someone to find that for me. Online, uh, something came in. Sometimes it can be scary if you can see where your path is heading. And it's not uh, what you as an individual has planned. Absolutely, because that means as much as we wanted to, Erica, the much as we think that we are in control, that we're not right? How crazy is that to think that everything that we've put in place, our planners, our, 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 diff our schedules, um, our, the different, our goals that we have in life, and all those different things that we have designed for us to be in control, how crazy is it to know that we are not in control? How crazy is it to know that the experiences in our life that we've have experienced already, that we would consider our past, God knew that we would experience. God knew that we would be the people that we are right now, today, because of our experiences. Whether we are the people we are birthed out of our experiences, whether we are the people we are because we said, you know what, I will never be like my experiences that I experienced in the past. Whatever it is, God designed it. God had us be here today with the experiences that we had because that's what makes you Erica. That's what makes you Juanita. That's what makes you Lady Bird. That's what makes you Penny, Andrew, Bill, Ruth, Joan, uh, that's what makes you sister white that's what makes you doris that's what makes that's what makes me me that's what makes you sheena we understand we can understand that we are the sum total of our experiences that's why you have the tenacity that you have that's why you can fight that's why you that's why that's why that's who you are because of your experiences and god is saying because of your experiences, you are on course to be who I've called you to be. You're not off schedule, you're on schedule. Thank you, Lord. I remember the scripture of Jonah. Jonah was a minor prophet. Jonah was the one who got swallowed up by the whale. You might remember that story. Jonah went in the opposite direction of Nineveh when God told him, hey, I need you to deliver a message to Nineveh Jonah got on a boat going in the opposite direction. He got on the cruise line and said, I want a ticket. And he went in the opposite direction, being disobedient to God, he thought. But if you know the story, Jonah gets out of the whale on the shores of Nineveh. Here's the thing that will blow your mind. If God knew that Jonah was already going to do that, then that means Jonah got there on time. Jonah wasn't late. I know y'all not going to talk to me, but that's all right. Jonah got there on time because God already knew that he was already going to go in the opposite direction. Jonah had to go in the opposite direction to be in the whale, because while he was in the big fish, he had to pray, ask God for forgiveness, and then he would be ready for Nineveh. It's all about the process. And that's what I was talking, preaching about last Sunday. It's about the process, not perfection, because the process is going to allow you to walk in God's path. The people that are in your life that get on your nerves, the people that are in your life that speak into you good things, the people that are in your life that you speak to them, whether it's from your pain or from things that you've known through your life experiences, is now making you, you are walking in the place that God needs you to be. 
I'm on the phone with a gentleman right now who hated me, told me not to show up to his wedding. I believe I mentioned it a few weeks ago. I told you guys about the story. This has been the third week that I've been on prayer with him while he's in jail, because you know what? Jail was a part of his process. Jail was a part of him getting to God. Jail was a part of him reconnecting with God and God already seen it. I knew what it would take for him to get to me. And I put it in his life. This is why we can't count people out. This is why we can't say, I'm done. Because you never know why God put them in your life in the first place. You never know why God is doing what he is doing in their life and in your life. And it could be perfecting both of you all at the same time. I know some of you are good for a good deal, a good coupon, a good sale. This is what God is doing. He gave you a two for one. And God is building you. And as I talk to you, each of you individually, you think about the things that are happening in your life and God is taking you through the process and causing you to walk in the places that he has already designed for you to walk in advance because he's taking you to the next place. He's taking you to the next level. He's bringing you closer to him. You don't even know it. You don't even see it as that. But I'm telling you so that you can be aware that he's taking you to the next place. I've been praying. Oh, uh, uh, pastor, I've been praying, you know, that I would have a more forgiving heart. Oh, do you know what that means? That means that you're going to go through some fallen places, some broken places. People are going to have to break your heart so that you can be ready to forgive them. He's got to put you in situations for you to be able to have that understanding. What are you praying for? And he brings you into these processes. He's bringing into you these places where health is not only the thing that makes life great, right? Because you can be in bad health and God will say, I'm going to teach you what it's like to worship me and love me, not in the best of health. I'm going to teach you what it's like to worship me and to love me and be alone. I'm going to teach you what it's like to love me when you have someone who doesn't believe who's your partner, and then you who believe. I'm going to teach you what it's like to love me in various situations, unemployed and unemployed. I'm going to teach you what it's like to own your business and not have a business, not have a thought. I'm going to teach you how to love me in every aspect of your life. I'm going to teach you what it is, where you thought that you're, you lost the opportunity with your children, but then I give you an opportunity to love on your grandchild the way you would have loved on your children and I'm giving you another opportunity and he recycles it and he takes you through a process and he builds you and he moves you forward in advance he had these things in plan everyone with me yeah amen, amen. all right Woo, I feel like preaching Lord have mercy. all right <laughs> Joshua chapter 6 verse 2 all right Joshua chapter 6 verse 2 who has that for me Joshua chapter six, verse two. Yeah, I have it. Go right ahead. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho. It's, um, it's king and all its strong warriors. <laughs> Woo. Okay, so God says, I delivered Jericho into your hands. No, that's not what he says. It says, I have delivered, yeah. past yeah. tense, past tense, Jericho into your hands. But that's the wrong verb tense, isn't it? Because he didn't take Jericho yet. Hmm. It should be future tense. It, 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 it hasn't happened yet. So why is it past tense? That brings us to the third thought. The third thought is everything is created twice. Everything 
is created twice. Everything was once a thought. There is an internal or mental or spiritual creation first. Then and only then is there a physical manifestation. That's what imagining unborn tomorrows is all about. So he says, let me go back to that scripture because that was that scripture was good. I'm going to reverse that. But he said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all of its strong warriors. He had not set foot in Jericho yet. They haven't walked around Jericho yet seven times for seven days. They haven't done that yet. And he already said, I have already given them to you, the king and its mighty warriors. It's already done because God is seeing things in eternity. It's already done. It is not in question. So when God begins to speak to you and he begins to speak to you through other people and he begins to speak to you maybe through me or another spiritual leader or, or, or through you alone, when God begins to speak to you, these are not things that might happen, may happen. Oh, maybe it's possible if the crescent moon comes out tonight. No, when God declares a thing, it's already done. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. Right? That's right, Deaconess Gregor. So when we understand that, when we understand that when God speaks, he doesn't speak in hypotheticals. He doesn't speak with contingencies. I do this only if you do this. He's saying, if he declares something to you or through someone else concerning you, it is done. Like the Bible says, it's like the rain coming out of the sky to feed the ground. As the, as, the, as the dew comes out of the sky, as the rain comes out of the sky to feed the ground, so does my word come out of my mouth and it will do what I said it would do, what I set it forth to do. There's no questions. It's not might, maybe. I don't care if you roll your eyes, shrug your shoulders. Hmm, I don't know. I don't think so. It's because God doesn't speak based on your experiences. You do. We do. God speaks on the definites. God speaks as the author who already wrote your story. It's hard to fathom that he wrote my story already. And I'm just catching up to where I am now. I can't even fathom what tomorrow brings. He says, Peter, now that you have done what I asked you to do, let's go out into the deep. Let's go out a little bit further in the water because there's something I need to show you there. And we, God takes us through a process. He takes us through a places. He takes us through experiences and we learn from them. We grow from them. And here you thought you were doing it all by yourself. No, God was like, I already wrote this down, baby. This is, has nothing to do with you. I've already written this out. But you're having these aha moments because you're catching up. When God says his thoughts are far off from ours, where he's brighter than us, we're on the we're on the short bus licking the windows. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? We're in that place where we can't comprehend him. Okay? We don't understand everything that he understands. He's talking about Jericho in a past tense. He's telling Joshua... I've already given you the city. I've given you the king. I've given you the mighty warriors. All you got to do is follow my instruction and it's done. So I didn't even plan all of this kind of talk with you guys. When God leads you to a Jericho, when God leads you to a place that is a mighty fortress, that's impenetrable, that's impossible, when God leads you to a place where you don't think you're going to be able to make it, you don't think you're going to be able to get through it, you don't see the other side of it, when God brings you to a Jericho and he tells you that he's already given it to you, when God puts something in front of you, whether good or bad, you've got to know you're going to get through it because God is not causing you to 
stop here. This is not a permanent place. He called us sojourners, meaning that we're moving through this world. We're moving through this earth. We're moving through this time. We're moving through these experiences. We're moving through the pain. We're moving through the blessed times. We're moving through the bad times. We're moving through the crazy times. We're moving through the things that make sense and the things that don't make sense. We're moving through them. So if you get to a circumstance and a situation that seems crazy, seems impossible, seems like there's no way out, you've got to know that you know that you know that your trust is in God to get you through it. Because if he brought you to it, he can bring you through it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can tell you their story. Daniel in the lion's den can tell you his story. Paul and Silas in the jail cell can tell you his story. Joseph can tell you his story. All these different ones can tell you their story. It wasn't peaches and cream. It wasn't just flowing with milk and honey. There were giants in the land. There was lions. There were fiery furnace. There was jail, prison time. There was all kinds of stuff. There was a, my wife, and I'm calling her my sister. I'm lying on who I am and who she is. I'm doing all kinds of crazy things. I'm stealing my brother's birthright for some food. I'm doing all kinds of crazy things, and yet they still find God and walk in his plan. I have given you Jericho as king and all of his strong warriors. The third thought is this. As I said, everything created twice. Everything was once a thought, internal or mental, as I said earlier. It's in the mind, it's in the spirit. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's already happening in heaven. It just needs to be manifested in time. It's already happened in eternity. It just needs to be manifested at its right time on the earth. It happened twice. It was created twice. That's why, again, when we look at this, I tell you this story. For those of you online, you're looking at a map. You're looking at a map of the city of Washington, DC. It first existed in the imagination of Pierre Charles La Affant. He was a military engineer turned urban planner, transferred those ideas to a 20 ounce piece of paper which is now sits in a plexiglass, um, breathing pressure, pressurized argon gas in the Library of Congress. When we navigate Pennsylvania Avenue or run into the National Mall, we are navigating places and spaces that once were thoughts and ideas. They are physical reality was nothing more than an idea that existed in the mind and the imagination of Pierre. And you're looking, the pictures that you're seeing online right now, you're looking at an idea. It was birthed once. It was created once in Pierre's mind. And then it was created a second time when it was actually physically built. This is the part of the image of God. It's that image that allows us to imagine. The Talmud. The Talmud is a central text of a rabbinic Judaism. It's the primary source of Jewish religious law and Jewish theology. Talmud. T-A-L-M-U-D, okay? And according to the Talmud, along with everything God spoke into existence during the six days of creation, God made provision for miraculous moments that would happen throughout human history. Again, 
This is a rabbinic tradition, but it's in keeping with God's character. He commanded the Red Sea to split apart, the sun and the moon to stand still for Joshua, the ravens to feed Elijah when he was by the brook and it dried up, the fish to spit out Jonah, the fire not to burn Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the lions not to harm Daniel. Simply put, when God gives a vision, he makes provision. When God gives a vision, when you see it, when you can see it, when you can see it in your mind, provision. He, he makes it work. He provides for the vision, provision. He provides for the vision. We've experienced that 101 ways as a church. And here's what I know for sure. We live at the intersection of two theologies and two realities. We live at the intersection of two theologies and two realities. The faithfulness of God is pursuing us from the past and the sovereignty of God is setting us up for the future. Okay. <laughs> I want you to write that down if you're taking notes. The faithfulness of God is pursuing us from the past. The faithfulness of God faithfulness of God is pursuing us from the past. What does that mean to you? What do you think that means? The faithfulness of God is pursuing us from the past. Any thoughts on that? The faithfulness of God is pursuing us from the past. Hmm. I don't know where you're going with that one. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. That's why we're that's why we're here, right? <laughs> exactly. Spit it and, out. And, it, and it's <laughs> quiet. So if everyone is quiet, I want you to write this down. All right. We we're we're taking this in pieces. The faithfulness of God is pursuing us from the past. I want to talk to you about when your mother prayed, your father prayed, your great grandfather, grandmother prayed for the family and said, Lord, I pray, you said, you said that my family shall come to know you. And I thank you, Lord, in advance, 50 years, 100 years before you were born, someone prayed for you, coworker, friend, before you got saved, someone prayed for you. All of a sudden, God is pursuing you from the past because you're living in the present. But your past, he said that I will, I will, I will. It is my plan. It is my will for me to go after them. It is my will that I will receive them. It's not about what you talk about, but it's that God is pursuing you from the past because there was a prayer prayed for you before you. Jesus told Peter, I prayed for you that your faith would fail you not. So God, his faithfulness pursues us from the past. God said, I will bless you. God says, I will keep you. God says, I, I have you covered. And all those things he spoke before you were even born. All those things he spoke before the seed came out of him into her, which is your mother. All of that happened before and his faithfulness pursues us from the past. Okay, y'all with me? And the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God is setting us up for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that means the all knowing God, mm -hmm. the omniscient one, mm -hmm. right? 
which is all knowing. He already knows the future. He already has met you in the future. You don't, you haven't met yourself, but God already knows your future state. God already knows you as who you will be now. He says, I know you don't get it now. I know you don't understand the situation you're dealing with now. I know you don't understand the why of what you're going through now. I know you might not get it all now, but if I could have you speak to the future you 10 years from now and what she or he would say to you now, all they would say to you is this, follow God because it's all a part of your process to get you where you need to go. Everyone in your life is prepping you. Mm -hmm. Everyone, every situation, every experience, he's prepping you. He's taking you to your future and God being sovereign, all knowing, all powerful, all present. He's sovereign. And God is, the sovereignty of God is setting us up for the future. This is why Satan had to go in front of God. God said to him, Lucifer, where are you coming from? He says to and fro throughout the earth. You can find that story in Job. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, yeah, I've considered him, but you have this hedge of protection around him that I can't touch him. And he says, if you would take the hedge from around him, I bet you I can get him to curse you and die. God says, okay, I'm going to allow you to touch him. I'm going to move the hedge, but you can't take his life. I'm going to move the hedge, but you can't take his life. Satan, I'm going to allow you to touch his life, but I'm not going to allow you to take his life. Wow. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And sometimes God will allow Satan to touch our lives, but not take it. Just like Judas had to be in Jesus' life. Not for him to be able to take it, but for him to, per, to push Jesus' prophecy of what he had to do into the present. And sometimes God will allow the devil to touch your life touch the people around you, influence the people around you. And God will allow that to be a part of your process. And if you would read the book of Job, you'll realize that Job came out better than he went into the trouble. And God will use the trouble. God will use the weapons that are formed against you, even though the Bible says that they won't prosper. That means that what the devil thought that he was going to be able to do with the weapon is not going to happen. But what God designed for the weapon to do, it will happen. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, but it shall, it shall propel you forward to your future. I got to go through some trouble. I've got to go through some, some, some pain. I've got to go through some turmoil. I got to go through some sacrifices. I've got to go through some of my processes and God will allow life, things out of my control, things that I put myself in. God will allow what the devil might try to do. He will allow those things to happen, not to destroy you, but to push you forward into a sovereign plan. And this is why I can count it all joy through the various trials and temptations that I go through because it's not destroying me, it's building in me as James talks about. 
It's not taking me out whatever was meant for your bad. I turn it for your good, as the Bible declares. I have a plan concerning you, not towards evil, but to give you a, an expected end, to give you a good thing, to give you what I've planned for you, to give you what I've designed for your life. I've got you. It is 8.02. We got to stop. All right. Lord, I'm...